Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkster. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Biz Simply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And Biz Simply is the all-in-one HR, workforce management, road and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long-term, not just survive. You've definitely got to like let things happen. Momentum is hugely important for a business. And whilst I would love to be constantly like tweaking under the bonnet of everything, that would come with a much slower, much less energetic business. And I think that would ultimately be a bad thing. Mm. So allowing things to happen that maybe are not like as perfect as you had in your mind is crucial. Mm. And letting, you know, also seeing when things don't go so well and almost like not celebrating that, but like making sure that, you know, we all kind of get together and go, right, that didn't go how we'd hoped. What do we do next? How, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? That kind of stuff. I think if you don't let stuff like that happen, you can't learn anything. This is Tom Elliott, co-founder of Pizza Pilgrims. Pizza Pilgrims started life in 2011 after Tom and James drove a three-wheel Piaggio Ape back from Italy on a six-week pizza pilgrimage, which the aim was to discover everything that's worth learning about pizza. And fast forwarding to today, they operate 13 locations in London and Oxford and more to come. I especially love the venture that is called the Pizza Academy, designed to inspire young people to choose hospitality as a career and also be their center of excellence for everything pizza. And according to my own children, Oscar and Freya, they make the best pizza in the world. And those two, I can promise you, have already eaten a lot of pizza in their short lifetime. Tom gives us a deep dive into their purpose, their leadership philosophy, culture, and why pizza and happiness is so closely connected, their approach to managing and developing people, their philosophy around growth, and what they are focusing on as a business right now, his view for the future of hospitality, and many other slices of wisdom. Before you tune in, please sign up for a weekly newsletter packed with more Maverick insights, strategies, and ideas. Find the link in the show notes. Visit hospitalitymavericks.com. If you believe culture drives your brand to the next level, stop what you're doing, grab a notebook, and order a great pizza. Enjoy. Today, we're here with Tom from Pizza Pilgrims, and we're going to be talking about happiness, pizza, and we agreed not to talk about Bruce Springsteen. It's oh. a shared, shared passion. Not a guarantee. Not a guarantee, yeah. Good, but welcome to the show. Tom, I'm really been looking forward. We have been back and forward a couple of times to to make the date work because we really wanted to make it happen, and then the universe just kept on putting barriers down. But then the universe presented us with that we basically live on the same road. Yeah, which is <laughs> kind of weird, but kind of excellent. It's, it, it it should have made things easier, but uh, you yeah, were surprisingly you, you, it was uh, yeah center parks and various other things got in the way. <laughs> so so the first thing I really wanted to dive into because what people are really listening into is that can you tell me a bit about why you and James came together and wanted to create a pizza business of all the things you can do in the world of all the things you can do in the world I think yeah I mean it, it, it's been 10 years ago now so it feels like you know you've got to really dig in to the depth of your mind to, to remember why but I mean bottom line is we both had our sort of proper jobs quote-unquote straight out of uni and um, we just didn't really enjoy them we were just not enjoying them James was working in TV I was working in advertising and I just I just you know was not getting any joy out of it and we'd always grown up in pubs and around hospitality businesses living above pubs since we were like six who james was maybe four and um so yeah he had that sort of in our in our blood i guess and uh you know we'd wanted we talked about trying to start a pub we didn't have enough money to do it and then we were just we, we were in the pub one night having a couple of beers as you do i think we always say it was somewhere between the like third and fourth pint that we were like what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna 
start a pizza business around a proper wood fired oven with you know some kind of vehicles carried around and try and join this sort of burgeoning street food scene that was happening in London at the time and uh yeah I mean it was it was a half formed half drunk idea uh so sort of scribbled on the back of a beer mat in a pub but um but yeah we, you know it's been it's been a crazy journey ever since and we, we've we've yeah I guess we've never really looked back why why did you land on pizza because you agreed it had to be you know good quality pizza wood oven and 10 years ago that was like still news in the pizza world in the UK yeah it was more normally electric pizza a lot of hyper processed yeah. stuff but what made you think that it has to be pizza is like is there any specific reason for that uh th- there were a couple of sort of Germ- I mean, it wasn't a kind of like, I don't want to sit here and say it was like, you know, ever since we were five, we wanted to be pizza, mm. pizza purveyors. But uh, we, uh, there were a couple of things. I mean, James, James had done a, a cooking course in Italy and mm. had seen like the prevalence of pizza ovens in people's gardens and homes and what have you. And it was obviously like, you know, the alternative to having a barbecue is to have a yeah. wood fired pizza oven, not just for cooking pizza and for cooking in whatever, like a domed wood oven so we'd had that sort of formative experience and we um we were looking at the street food scene and it basically you know the pizza decision it kind of came down to something really rather sort of boring and cold which was looking at the street food scene that was really starting to take off at that time there was no one doing pizza when mm. we looked and i think the, the you know at the time that felt like a bizarre omission because it was like well surely this is just such a staple for the you know it's, it's it's a food you want at a festival but what quickly became clear is you know it's it's much more of a barrier to entry to get into pizza as a street food van than it is a burger because you know you can you can set up a burger store with a griddle plate that costs you 50 quid and you can carry it under your arm basically whereas for a pizza you need obviously a big oven that costs you a lot of money and also requires a pretty serious vehicle to get it around so yeah, I guess, you know, as usual, we sort of were like, oh, pizza, that's obvious. Let's, why don't we do that? And then all the all the reasons why people didn't do pizza <laughs> flooded in. But we, uh, we we carried on regardless. But it's also the, uh, you call it the, the founder's naivety when you, yeah. you, you you start a business. And, and, and that's, that's, that's sometimes where magic happens as well. Because you do it, the counterintuitive than everybody else doing it. The hard bit, the, the non-scalable bit sometimes. We... we, we yeah constantly talk about how little we knew about running despite having kind of grown up in pubs we'd never really run them so yeah that that kind of lack of kind of 20 years of restaurant experience just made us make decisions so differently in the early days and so many of the things that we do today we do because you know we started from a very different very different place and and I, i think it's what's you know helped us remain special from the beginning and then you decided to go to italy Yes, well, we we had decided to go to Italy originally for a very cold, hard reason that it was just going to be cheaper to buy the van there. But actually, once we realized that obviously we knew nothing about pizza at all, this idea of, of, of picking the van up there to save money, but also driving her back and learning about pizza, going to sort of crucial pizza places on the way, that started to take shape and we kind of started to draw up a little map of place. And I think we'd, I told my employer that we'd be away for about 10 days, maybe something like that. And uh, yeah, I just very vividly remember pulling out of that, uh, pulling out of that garage in Reggio di Calabria and really realizing quite how slow a Piaggio Ape is <laughs> and that you're not allowed to take it on the motorway. So I think, uh, yeah, after a week, we were nowhere near home. But um, yeah, and, and I mean, the, the strange thing that happened, I guess, was that you know, we had this idea for the trip and we were just setting off to do it. And then, uh, to keep long story short, I emailed one of my bosses in the advertising agents I worked in and said, we're going to go and start this um, pizza company. And I hear you're leaving to start a bakery. She was one of the senior people. Um, it'd be great to go for a beer and talk about us both going to bake things. And uh, so we went around to her house in Camden. And it turned out how her husband was a very famous food writer called Tim Haywood. Mm. I didn't know that. And uh, he was the guy who was like, this trip to Italy is amazing. You've got to like absolutely make the most of it. You've got to try. Maybe you should make it into a TV show. Like, you know, he had these huge sweeping ideas that we had not begun to have. And so the next morning we wrote a pitch for a TV company and and sent it out. And long story short, we ended up making it into a TV show. So it was on uh, about 12 to 14 people watched it. 
Uh, it was <laughs> not hugely popular, I will say. But it was on the Food Network in, I think it came out about 2013, something like that. Uh, I still haven't watched it. <laughs> it's just like, but it was, it was, what was, what was amazing about that TV show was it gave us access. So we were going to places like Damakali and they were allowing us in the kitchens and like meeting all the chefs and meeting all the, the dough masters and, you know, going behind the scenes in Caputo and, it was a lot of that stuff. So it was amazing, you know, how many people we got to meet through that happening. Um, but yeah, that definitely didn't make us uh, TV stars. Um, did it also help you clarifying what Pizza Pilgrims was all about doing these things? Like, did it get help with clarity around, you know, the the proposition, you know, the quality you wanted to do? Because it happened by accident almost because you... Uh, I mean... The short answer is no. I don't know whether like the world just didn't talk in missions and North yeah, Stars yeah. then or whether we just didn't know about that stuff or whether we just, you know, we really didn't set out to, to make Peace of Pilgrims what it is today. It was, honestly, for me, really, it was something to get me out of advertising and to prove that I could do something that wasn't just advertising because it was, you know, it was back in, it was just after the first crash really and so like once you once you you picked your career you're very much railroaded in that career and I was trying to get out of it so it was like well I'll go and do this with James realistically I don't think this business is going to support both of us but I'll go and do it with James you know I'll do it for a year prove that I could start something up and show a bit of initiative and then hopefully from there I can go and change tack so yeah that we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't kind of set out on this journey to, to do this massive thing that's you know so much bigger and more amazing than we could possibly have ever imagined i guess the one moment of clarity the pilgrimage did bring is like sounds quite trite but sat down in damakali for the first time in the seat where julia roberts sat uh and having that pizza and being like i've never tasted anything like this before like how do we just if we can take this and just recreate it in london i mean game on and that that was a moment of like how can something this delicious have existed for 28 years of my life and me not have tasted it? Mm. So, yeah, it was um, that that was probably the most clarifying moment of that trip. Do you think it had had an impact further down the journey as you, you did that early on and then that had helped you really clarifying that hugely what you so. expect from the business, how you want to do things? Yeah, hugely so. And I think the sort of the... the I mean, in so many ways, I think that what it stood for, obviously it became the name of the business, which we didn't know at the time, but like what it stood for in terms of, uh, you know, just that kind of have a go attitude and just, you know, let's do something a bit crazy. But also all the people we met and like the passion and energy that they put into what they do. So whether that's making mozzarella or making flour or making pizza, obviously, like that stuff just really rubs off on you. And you're like, we well, know if we're going to do pizza we want it to be the best pizza you can get and that, that's the amazing thing about pizza is you can you can it's one of the few foods i think where you can genuinely go we want this to be the best it can be and still be an affordable option for everyone so that is um that's been a you know a really nice thing that we can genuinely endeavor to make the best and buy the best and we can still charge you you know significantly under 10 quid for a margarita in your your happiness manifesto you says that pizza bring happiness to the world how does pizza do that I mean, I kind of do know and I don't know. Obviously, like, you know, there's probably... We just wrote this book uh, and we we asked a lot of people. We interviewed a lot of people for the book. And that's everything from, like, Franco Pepe, who's sort of accepted as one of the greatest pizza chefs in the world, to CEO of Pizza Hut, to, um, you know, the operations director of Domino's, like, pizzerias from New York, all over the world. And we asked all of them, why does pizza make people happy? Why, why does pizza have this special place in humanity? Because when you go online... People talk about pizza like they talk about their spouse. It's kind of like the thing they turn to in t hours of need. And, uh, you know, all those T-shirts you see, like, pizza is my boyfriend and, like, all that stuff. Like, you just don't get that with hamburgers or tacos. It just doesn't – it's not there. So the answers that came back were incredible. I mean, some people – well, one person touched on this democratic thing of, like, it's one of the few things that you can aspire to having the best. You, not, not many people could have the best car or the best house or maybe even the best steak, but you can definitely have the best pizza. And I think that, that's really interesting. There was someone who said, because uh, it's round, so like you kind of feel like you can kind of share it. It lets you in. 
there was someone saying about you know flavor combinations there was someone saying it's because you eat with your hands and it's very like therefore very kind of like caveman visceral uh there were so many good answers uh, i mean it's just i think it's probably a combination of all those things it's you know it's a thing that you you kind of it comes to you like a in, you know nowadays in a, in a magic box you know that's kind of just arrives at your door share it with mates you're usually doing it a fun you know a fun time you're usually having it for watching a game or watching a movie um you know there's limitless combinations to the toppings uh there, there are so many reasons and i just think there are so you never have a bad pizza like i mean i can't think of a time in my life where i've had a pizza and gone that was inedible but again that that does happen you can have a inedible hamburger for sure can you have an edible pizza I, I just don't know if you can and so yeah it just it never lets you down which is obviously kind of really what you'd want from uh, from any any human you were going to be friends with the very powerful things there is bringing people together is the share of the joy of sharing something and it's about exactly something everybody can afford to have something good of yeah in the world especially when we talk about in today's world yeah with you know yeah. food food crisis in no, completely. across the world completely um you also talk about in the the happy manifesto you talk about that you cannot make everybody happy you are not a pizza what was the thinking around that quote well i guess that's what i just touched on there is like you know everyone loves pizza i mean i know by just by saying this all the people that don't love pizza will come out of the woodwork <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's it's a great option if you're, like, getting people around or, you know, it's pretty unlikely that someone won't be into it. Obviously, you've got the rise of gluten-free and vegan and all that stuff, which we're catering for now. But pizza is, you know, it's it's a word that, like, peps you up. It, you know, it's not a word that's like, oh, broccoli. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, you know, I think pizza is one of those great things that just, you know, it always, always is always a popular choice. I feel like this is not the most exciting answer in the world, but yeah, I, it's just a it's just a funny quote. I can't remember where the quote came from. Um, I think it might be like a Bill Murray quote or something like that. Mm, mm, oh yeah, that's a, that that gives good sense when you say that. Yeah, yeah. So as you've been on this journey, how have you all this come together? You know, your 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 journey to Italy, you know, the happiness manifesto, the, the, the values you very clearly know. How would that all come together to build the culture you want to do? And how is that, you know, how do you build and maintain a culture like that? And especially, you know, the times we've just been through with the pandemic really challenged us, you know, all our beliefs and behaviors as business owners and leaders. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really hard. And I think, um, I think something that we do struggle with at Pizza Films, I think, is that we... We, we we see ideas as quite disposable because we have quite a lot of them. So like we'll have an idea, we'll do it, it will be good or bad or indifferent, and then we'll never think about it again. And uh, in some ways that's great because it means we're constantly doing fresh things and innovating and trying new things. In many ways, like some of our biggest successes, we can end up just like becoming a blip because you know we we should be focusing on the stuff that worked really well and like doing it again. God mm. forbid. Um, but. I think the answer to your question is not to do that. I think it's basically pick what you're about and then just keep at it. And I think that, that you know, we've got to keep talking about these values until, you know, we are obviously, we know them well. We talk about them a lot. To us, it, it's almost boring now. It's like we know these, like, it's for, like, what's the next message? But actually, it's not about the next message. It's about keeping those, making sure everybody knows them, everybody understands them. Everybody lives and breathes them, and have the opportunity to live and breathe them. Um, and I think, I think without, yeah, I think the, the danger would be to kind of constantly trying to bring new stuff in. And I think we know, we know what we're about now. These are the things that have got us here. You know, they're the things we were practicing on the market stall by accident. I think we've managed to like bottle what they're about. Obviously, we're not getting it perfect, and we never will. Um, there are too many of you, uh, which just still blows my mind. But. We need to keep we need to keep at it and keep that clarity of message of like, you know, we are here to make people's day, to make people that little bit happier, whether you're a team member, a customer, or have frankly any interaction with Pizza Pilgrims, a supplier, you know, delivery driver, I don't care. Like Pizza Pilgrims is here to make your day that little bit better. And that that's the bit that we've got to keep remembering. And I think I think the way to do that is through our values. Um and just keeping clear on what they are and being focused on on delivering them. 
We once got Fred. Brave Fred from, uh, um, uh, what's he called, the dating show, First Dates, yeah. came to talk to us. And he was saying, like, you know, look at the church. Whatever you think about the church, they have been a successful thing. And the way they've done that is by having one message for 2,000 years. They've not gone, oh, let's reinvent this or rethink it or change it or put in a snazzier story or, you know, do a remix. It's just like, no, here's what we're about. Here's the story. It's all written down. Here are the central tenets. Keep banging that drum. Clarity is what you need. You need everybody to get it. And I think, you know, the, I'm not suggesting that we are anything near or like the church, but that idea of like, once you've figured out what you're about, like stick with it. Don't don't lose focus on that, I think is, is crucial. And I think we really want to try and keep doing that and find new and interesting ways to bring those values to life for people in the pizzerias. And it's interesting, uh, the church is all about rituals. And as you talked about, it, we sometimes we just try to innovate too much and actually forget the foundation of what actually brought us here and actually bring us together. Completely, completely. Uh, so trying to, you know, some of our most successful things have become ritualistic. So like Ferragosto, every year we kind of have a day off. It's, it's an Italian holiday, obviously, originally. But, you know, everyone gets together and it's it's just, you know, it's a nice sort of quote unquote family day. And that's something that we've done every year. And it's, it's you know, it brings us closer together. And trying to find more of those rituals um, that remind us of why we're here and what we're doing it for is is a really big part of, of getting this right. Yeah, super interesting. You also talked about that you sometimes have done some things where you thought, okay, well, we move on, we've done this. Are you can give an example of there where you maybe canned something, you find out that, wow, we just dropped something quite amazing here. Um, I mean, there are just so many examples of like marketing initiatives that we've done or, you know, uh, spe- I mean, a classic one is specials, pizza specials that we've done that, you know, we do them for a month they're great and then we never revisit them ever again and it's like why why are we not you know bringing back the ones that we know are, are fantastic i think it's just that constant desire of like oh but we've done that we've got to, we can't do that again but that's silly and i think yeah so, so you know there's a lot of, there's a lot of good examples in in the menu and in food where we've we've dropped things and 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 not come back to them when we should have done uh i think things like um some of our, you know, some some of our more kind of silly things, like we had our fifth birthday and we had five come and headline the the party just because it felt silly and fun, and we've never like revisited that kind of party of just like just have a band and you know that sem- like a semi famous band from because a lot of what we're about is kind of pop culture but kind of yesteryear pop culture. So trying to bring more of that to the fore would be really cool, but you know we just we never we never go back. We're always looking at the next thing. Which, like I say, is is great in in many ways. But you know, you look at a lot of great businesses, and they they, you know, when when they find something that works, they just do it over and over again. And we've just not we've not done that so much. Is there any business that Pizza Pilgrim are looking at when it comes to building culture where you get inspired from? Because where they have this consistency and the rituals you're talking about, is there any anyone you you could share? I mean, the there are, there are just so many. I mean. Uh, the one that always comes back to, and I, you know, we 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 um, talk about it a lot, is Timpsons. Mm. So they're a um, very famous English uh, shoe repairing company, uh, and we we, had, we were lucky enough through a sort of weird connection to to spend a day with John Timpson about seven or eight years ago, and he has this just incredible philosophy around upside down management, and you know, the most important people of the company are the people serving the customer. Everyone else is there to support them. But he just had so many thoughts that I 100% agree with around, like, you know, budgeting, like, you know, to write down a budget that tells you what you're going to be making in three years time is is a complete waste of everyone's time because who knows what's going to happen in that time. So, you know, anti-budgeting. They have no marketing department, which I think is fascinating. They only rely on customer feedback. So, you know, I thought all of this was a bit of a kind of gimmick. But you go to the head office, there is no marketing department. There's not one human pushing stuff out there the only people marketing are the store managers putting things outside the stores and the you know encouraging customers to to tell other customers when they have a good experience and also this is a company that they're built on fundamentally mending shoes which no one does in 2022 (laughs) they all buy new shoes and then their second big push was into developing photos i mean like this is a company that is resilient beyond you know the changing of industries you know 
things like Kodak have disappeared because no one has a camera that needs developing anymore. But Snappy Snaps is still on every high street in the country. Um, I'm sure they have plenty of woes, but you know they adapt. Every time you walk past them, they've got a new service that they offer you. And also just lovely things. Like, you know, they do a lot of stuff hiring ex, ex-cons, which we're starting to do now in the academy. Um, but there was a really lovely thing after the first um, crash. They did a thing where if you were going for a job interview, they would dry clean your suit yeah. for free. And it's just like, what I love about that is there's a real human at the, back, the beginning of that. You know, that idea, the, the, the kernel of that idea was not dreamt up in a boardroom or by a marketing team. It was dreamt up by a human being going, what is it you really need when you're, you know, when you're going for your first job interview? And it's like that little bit of confidence. How can we help with that? Oh, we can make your suit look great. And I, I love that. That's such a simple, simple thought. And I think I'd, I really want us to do more stuff like that. Like bring, make sure that everyone knows that, you know, Pizza Pilgrims is still run by humans who have like mm. ideas that are flawed, but also just real. Yeah. And it's a great example because they are, I've studied themselves myself a bit because really fascinating this, you know, business has been handed down the family and they, they're constant focusing on just being 1% better. 1%, 1%, yeah. not win some kind of crazy thing yeah. or hit some crazy, crazy targets. It's like, we're going to be 1% better tomorrow than we was yesterday or today and they're just focusing on that all the time and sometimes it goes wrong we go back and we move on and then they build that resilience when the storm comes Completely. because also know everybody that in the organization know they're safe because Completely. there's cl- total transparency as you say with the, the bottom up both on numbers and what is expected from you completely and something he said to me that i just thought was so true is not punishing the many for the for the kind of actions of the few yeah. So if someone, you know, they haven't got unbelievably a thousand plus stores, they haven't got a centralized till system that tells head office what, you know, every till, every store has got no electronic till and they do all their own numbers and they send it by email to the head office. It's just completely, you know, it's completely sort of humanly done. But, you know, if a store, you know, is down on the money, someone's been putting their hand in the till or something like that's gone wrong, another company would go, right, this thing has happened to make sure it never happens again. We're going to put in this huge policy. We're going to put in tills in every store. We're going to like tighten every single bolt. It will never happen again on my watch. And actually, that's point zero 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 one percent of your workforce making a mistake. Obviously, they should be held accountable for the mistake. But don't punish the 99.999% who didn't do it, who've been doing everything right and are doing what you asked of them. Like So that thing of like the collateral damage, like... When things like that happen, obviously it's bad and obviously, you know, it needs to be properly looked at. But what it can't be is then a reason to, like, turn the turn the screw on everyone else because everyone else has been doing it fine. And I think that that's something that we've always tried to practice. It's like, you know, things will go wrong. That doesn't mean that they'll go wrong or that everyone should, should have to bear the brunt of it. What you talk about there as well is something I wanted to ask you about as well is like leadership philosophy or leadership approach, mindset, impacts the culture and the way you deal with things when things happen because your culture really comes to life when things go wrong. How have you as you know one of the founders and how are you as founders work with actually ensuring that from day one that you know these kind of thinking approach to thing is really implemented as you grow because that's the really hard bit. Yeah, well, I think, you know, where me and James always come from is sort of a position of just ridiculous forgiveness, I guess. Like, we let, you know, in the early days, like, honestly, we let we, we let things happen that we shouldn't have let happen and, 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 and not given the kind of, uh, and we didn't do enough to follow up with them in terms of, you know, if someone makes a mistake, you let them off and then they do it again and then let them off again. And I think, you know, I guess we were trying to build a, breed a culture of trust I suppose in that it's like look you know we're all in this together if you make a mistake we're here to support you what you quickly get to with that is all the people around them who are doing the right things looking up going well like if that person's not being held accountable for doing that then this whole thing is going to fall to bits and so like that that idea of like there's got to be there's got to be lines and there's got to be real clarity over like this is what you can do this is what you can't do if you you repeatedly are on the wrong side of that line you have to take action, not because of that person particularly, but because of the people all around them. So you end up, you know, almost on the flip side of what we were just talking about, there's a team of 20 and one person underperforming or breaking the rules or whatever. 
in order to do the best for everyone, you, you know, that you probably have to remove that one person because the 19 others will feel will thank you for it. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's the bit that I think we were on the wrong side of it when we first started Pizza Pilgrims. And I think we, we now, you know, through uh, Gavin, who's our MD, and all, all of the exec team, like there's a real understanding now between us of like where the red lines are and how best to deal with it. And, you know, always with a view to giving people a second chance and like understanding that people make mistakes. But also we are a team. And if you're repeatedly letting down your team, we're not going to stand for it. Mm. Mm. Um, and I guess that that's a natural development as well if you don't come from from the background of building a large team and so on you, yeah. you have to get these learnings and yeah, still be course. human and then and, and, uh, i think there's a very human and you know we need everybody needs a second chance absolutely and I, you know i really i really fundamentally believe that and we've had so many examples of it in pizza pilgrims you know both giving people a second chance to come back but also when people do go you know and people obviously move on and they go traveling and they change jobs of course they do but you know when they come back that's the moment that I'm just like, we did something right. Mm. When, when people leave and come back to Pizza Pilgrims afterwards, I feel so proud of that because it feels like you're definitely doing something right if that's the case. It's very interesting. One of my previous CEOs in McDonald's, Steve uh, Shellington was his name in Denmark. I, and I left after three years and he was. Uh, he said, we'll see you again. I thought, not this time, not a third time. And I came back a third time. So it's it, and then again, it's a credibility to to the leaders and, and the systems you're part of that actually you want to come back because you just need to go and try something. Sometimes people, everybody needs to go and try something. And I think that's from from an industry point of view. I think it's really interesting. Sometimes we just need to let them run. They will come back again if you've done your job. A hundred percent. Like you know, you know, there's no point in building up loads of walls around them because you know people will people absolutely should be allowed to get out. But it's exactly that wanting you know building something that they want to come back to and I think that that's the bit that we've got to remember is you know what what would it what what do you need to build to make people come back mm. I think it's so so fascinating and I think um yeah it's it's something that you know we we work we work really really hard to make just the little things count a piece of pilgrims I think it's very easy for people to put you know here's the amazing trip that we're doing you know on LinkedIn look at this one moment in time where I photographed everyone and they were smiling mm. Those kind of statements are fine, but quite often they're a plaster for bigger issues to me. It's like the day-to-day -day stuff that you've got to get right. It's like everything, you know, you come into work 364 days a year. Hopefully not, actually. You have days off. <laughs> but um, however many days a year, like we want those days to be good, not just the day when you went and had a massive party. And that, that you know, that, that stuff, that, that little stuff of like the day-to-day -day just looking after each other and making sure that, you know, you're, being paid right and on time and, you know, that you get fed properly and that, you know, all that stuff is, is happening as a natural. And I think, you know, that, that some of that naivety stuff, I think, you know, when people talk about some of the stuff they do for their employees and I'm like, I can't believe you're talking about this as if it's like something amazing. This is just such, such a, like a non-event thing for us. Um, trying to, you know, trying to try to have those things just so baked in that it's like never questioned. Um, but, you know, th th those things do get questioned and you've got to fight. But that's when you you know the investors come in and go, well, we should not be giving everyone pizza every day. It's like absolutely like the classic example is coffee. We give I think of all the coffee we buy, more than two thirds of it goes to our team. Mm. We give so much more coffee to the team than we give to the customers. So like any you know any money person looking in would be like, just get rid of the coffee and you'll make more money. But actually, you know, our guys really want to have lots of coffee. So great, let's keep doing it. Um, you know, let's do more of it. So. Yeah, I think those kind of things, just those everyday things are really important that we, we don't lose them because they can easily get like scrubbed out. Yeah, the, I guess it comes from where the counterintuitive thing sometimes is that the spreadsheet says, but the counterintuitive thing said, yeah, it might not give business sense, but it gives lots of sense yeah. in a cultural setting. Because if we take that away, there will be you know riots. Completely, <laughs> completely, completely. And I, those are the things that we've got to, We've got to keep pushing on. Like, what are those human things that that just give people that lovely little reason to come to work? Yeah, but, uh, as we all know, coffee and pizza <laughs> are very important in life. And beer. And beer. Yeah. Um, 
Also, you talked a bit about as you've been growing the business, what has your approach been to growth? Because you didn't set out to say, we want to make a thousand restaurants and no. be the next McDonald's or so on. So what is the approach to growth? Because growth is very connected to the purpose, the culture, I believe, that the way you think about growth and how you approach it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first thing is that like for both me and James, like this is so way beyond what we set out to do that actually, you know, we just feel like we're in this kind of, you know, Neverland, basically, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is fine. I think, you know, from, from a growth point of view, we've never been particularly obsessed with growth. I think probably the only thing that made us sit up and go growth really important is um, providing opportunity for the team. Like if you're not growing, you know, the, the great people you have probably won't be able to stay with you. Mm. Not because they don't love working with you, but because you're just not going to provide them the opportunity they need. You know, you can't go up the ranks. You can't, you know, there's not, there's not, headroom for you to kind of develop yourself so that probably for me and James is the number one reason that we grow um, I, I just have like pure terror around like people saying we need to open X number of pizzerias this year I'm just like there needs to be about 25 qualifiers in there because I would prefer to open zero pizzerias if none of them are going to be great or exciting or different or provide something new but yeah But, you know, if we find five fantastic ones that have all got, like, a real reason and a heart and a soul and are, like, I totally get why this would be a good thing for us, then let's do the five. But let's not do five if there aren't five good ones to do. You know, we are still, unfortunately, not in the metaverse with Pizza Pilgrim. So, like, bricks and mortar and locations and, you know, that stuff can't just be magicked out of thin air. And I think, you know, what we've seen from some of our peers I guess is just growing too quickly and that you lose you know you lose what you set out to do that's special but if you grow too slowly you'll also lose it because you'll lose the people that made it special so you know we've tried to like balance that I, th I think we've we've done we've done a pretty good job we've got you know we've got some people in the company who would want us to go faster I think some people would probably want us to go slower and you know we just try and try and as always the answer to most things lies somewhere in the middle mm. and we try and uh, we try and balance that so yeah we've got some openings coming up but we've not got loads and loads um so yeah it's just it's just making sure that we one of our investors very early on said to us like make sure you've you know you've always squared away the last one you opened before you open the next one yeah and i think we've i've always had that in the back of my mind like if if i feel like we've not obviously you know Everything's always developing, but if I feel like we've got one that's got particular problems, try and try and slow down the the rush until that one's got its got its raison d'être. Yeah, because suddenly it will become even bigger if you don't deal with the problem. Yeah, the, up, up, often it starts to become a cultural problem, not just a commercial problem. That's when the tail wags the dog yeah. for sure. Um, so, yeah, but you know, we. we, we When we, I remember when we had Dean Street and it was just me and James, you know, and, and Tom Mullin, of course, and uh, and a few others. Uh, I think Davide was there towards the end. Of, like, we just couldn't imagine having two pizzerias. We were like, there's just so much mm. to do. And this is so, you know, there's so many things I want to fix. And I still feel like that. I still feel like we could take two years out from Pizza Pilgrims from opening new restaurants and just focus on, like, cool, innovative stuff for our existing estate. I feel like we could fill those days, no problem at all. But if you do that, you know you're not you're not providing opportunity for more people. So you've got to, you just got to strike that balance. I think it's super interesting. It's also about growth. It's also about opportunity for for your people and actually making sure you progress. Yeah, you progress in a way that that everything is in balance. Yeah, which is, of course is a master act in everything in life. Yeah. Um, what about uh, your your people? You talked about it's about growing your people. What do you, do you do? What do you do actually to make sure they keep on moving? So they move one percent as the business does every day. And so this is you know this is where I just take my hat off to to the team. I think you know we we've always been about developing people and trying to give people opportunities to be better and grow into into stuff. And um, I think that's where. Uh, Certainly, Gavin, our MD, and Haley, and Leanne, and Shaw, and the people team. Like, the academy was was sort of mine and James's idea, I guess, to be like, let's build somewhere that's a semi-live environment that people can actually develop themselves. Whether that's, you know, your first day on the job and it's just a nice, you know, easy way to like figure out how to do it, or whether you're, you know, the chairman of the company and you're there to learn about social media, or, you know, whether you're a manager wanting to learn about stock control, like. Those kind of we wanted a place where that kind of stuff can happen, but 
being honest, like me and James are not the 1% everyday type people. I 100% believe it. I, I totally agree that that's the way to helpfully build something is like one brick at a time, slowly, slowly. But we're useless at it because we're just like, unless it's like big and fast and crazy, we're, you know, we just get probably, the word is probably bored. We just have like very low attention spans. <laughs> Speaking for James, he's not here. <laughs> but I certainly have the attention span of a five-year-old. And this is where like, you know, Gavin and Haley and the people team, like they have, they've built, you know, in that vision of like, how do we develop people in the right way? They've built this amazing structure of everyone having proper reviews and proper targets and proper agreed, like, you know, this is the step you want to get to. Here's how we're going to get you there. And I love, you know, I love watching that play out. And when we see our, you know, really great people, leave. we, I think in the past, because we're not very good at the 1%, would over promote. So we would, you know, find someone great and we're like, this person's brilliant and they'd be talking the right game and we'd be like, great, you know, you're a general manager. Fantastic, you're going to be an ops manager. And it felt good at the time, but then you just watch all of the good work just break because you're putting people in jobs they're not equipped to do. And as much as, you know, at the time, it feels like, well, I want to go up and I want to be there now. And like, why am I not there now? The amount of times I've seen it where you just, you over promote someone who is great, but they're just not ready. And, that is where Gavin and the team have been so great to be like, cool, you want to get to here? This is how you get here. And it's not a two-month journey. It's a two-year journey or a three-year journey. But these are the steps you're going to take. And we're going to check in with you. And we're going to provide you with these tools. And we're going to give you like you know a month shadowing this person. And I, I, just, I just think that's magic when you see the end of that journey. When you've been like, I want to get from here to there. And I've been given the steps to get there. And I get there and I feel confident to do it. That is an amazing thing to me. And it's it's something that I think hospitality is so uniquely placed to do for people because you can develop quickly. You know, that, that same journey in a massive engineering company would probably take you 30 years. So I love I love watching it unfold, but but don't do it too quickly. And, and therein lies, you know, a big part of that happiness thing with like, you know, knowing where you're going, giving the tools to get there, you know, see, you know feeling that feeling of um, satisfaction when you do get there, when you're like, God, I did that. We did that together. We got here. And if that's instantaneous, the gratification is instantaneous, but the reward is, you know, it ebbs away quickly. So, you know, I think I think building those real career journeys for people. And, and we've got, I'd love to see more examples, but we've got, you know, the, the five-year club is, is an ever-growing one. Every year we have more and more people who turn up and we kind of celebrate. We just, I mean, this year we went curling. I have no idea why. <laughs> it felt like I've always wanted to go. It felt like a good thing to do. So we went curling, went and had a burger and a beer. And it wasn't anywhere near enough to thank those people for everything they've done for us. But it is gratifying to see that club growing and to see like people from all ranges within the company, from, you know, people who started with us as a waiter all the way up to, um, you know, a head chef or a manager or an ops manager. Obviously, Tom Mullen is the greatest example. He's been with the company for, you know, near enough 10 years now. Mm. Um, one of our, I think, maybe the fifth employee we ever had worked with us on the van and is now still, I really believe, like, you know, such a fundamental part of the business and still growing and still learning as, as we all are. So, yeah, I think, you know, those those long journeys and, and just making sure that every day is still a school day for people is 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 really important to us. You talk a lot about, you know, the connection on the internal bit, but I also know from looking and being a customer myself, you really try to connect with the customers some more. They're not just customer, they're not just a transaction. It's like a community and you really reached out to the community during the pandemic with the, the pizza at home kit and yeah. so on and so on. Can you talk a bit about, you know, how have you approached that? Has that happened again by bit by you standing on the market stall, building those relationships? It's like crucial. In, yeah. in street food but tell us a bit about that yeah it's fascinating so like the street food thing is a such a unique thing there is no job in hospitality where you you know you, you engage with the customer you take their order you take their money you make it in front of them and then you give it to them and then you watch them eat it and get almost instantaneous feedback like that complete feedback loop just you know there's no role in pizza programs today that has that like you're either a chef or you're at the front of house or you're, you're, not, you're not seeing the whole picture so you know I guess that started there I would say, honestly, as a company, we obviously, you know, the customers are massively important to us, but we've always put more energy into the team. I think the, the philosophy has always been, if we look after the team and the team are happy and they've got everything they need to do a good job, the customer bit just falls out of that because, you know, you've then got a happy team who feel confident to do it their way and own a situation and therefore 
And that that's very much the Timson thinking of like the, the customer bit is the output rather than something that we like work on. I, th I, I feel like we're still there, although, you know, we're starting to engage with our customers more. I mean, in a hugely controversial statement, I worry about, you know, all everyone and anyone asks us now, particularly about marketing is, you know, what's your data strategy? How much data have you got? And what do you do with it? Like, what do you do? You know, how much big, you know, big data and how are you using that data to develop your offer and your proposition? And we do have some data. Honestly, we don't look at it <laughs> like ever, which is a mistake. I will put my hands up. Gavin will be cringing right now. But my worry is that like data to me, which is if you ask loads of people, what do you want from a pizzeria? That you're going to end up with every pizzeria in the country being the same. Um, and then all, you know, you'll, we'll have chips on the menu and we'll have chicken on the pizza. And I think we've got to, you know, we've got to be bigger than that. And I think what, what we're trying to do is more like sort of, qualitative research around like get get groups of people who have been on the journey with us and go like you know what do you love about pizza program is what do you not love is the stuff that we've you know what have we done well what have we done less well try and like develop it that way rather than we asked a hundred thousand people and they all said this i just to me that's just not very human mm. but i appreciate that that is you know the data is gonna have the answer i am a statistician at uh, in training and i understand that that is that is that, but I, I just think restaurants with soul shouldn't be built on data-based decision-making. They should be built on like human-based decision-making. So we're trying to get better with data, and I am slowly but surely agreeing that my approach is not okay in 2022. But I do think we've got to keep just listening to our customers in a sort of more human way and doing stuff that way. It's interesting with the soul, because recently I read about what Danny Meyer is spending a lot of his time on right now, is actually moving around, listening to customers and employees. He still looks at data, but he said, I need to hear the stories before I can qualify if the data is confirming the right thing. Yeah. And the same with Howard Schultz, we just talked about this morning, Yeah. back into Starbucks now. First thing he does is traveling around, trying yeah. to understand how people feel. And that's the crucial thing is how people feel. And like, I love, one of my favorite things to do, unless it goes wrong, but it <laughs> mostly doesn't, is just sit outside of Pizza Pilgrims and just listen to what people say. Mm. And quite often, like, and I recommend any of you to do it because, you know, most of the time, if I'm honest, I, I hate blowing my own trumpet or it's all of your work, so it doesn't have nothing to do with me. People walk past and go, oh, I love Pizza Pilgrims best pizza that place or oh, we must go there again or like I had the best time there or that's my favorite pizza place in London or like you, you hear those statements over and over and over again and I think as much as that's not telling us anything about how you guys have made it so successful but it is just gratifying to see you know to, to sit and just listen to what people say because those are the people that are really important not necessarily the people who are saying oh my this was obviously we need to listen to the problems too but it's so nice to hear the the good stuff. And I think so often I go past all the good stuff, which is reams and reams, you know, walk, scroll past 30 five star reviews, find a one star one and be like, it's a nightmare. Like, it's all over. Like, this person had <laughs> a bad experience. And, I, you know, I, I've, got, I've got to be better at that. It's like, there's so much good out there with Pizza Pilgrims, just sitting and sitting and listening to it. Sometimes. If you're having a, you know, one of those days that I talked about, like, might be worth just sitting and just listening to some of the customers and just w hear what they say because nine times out of ten you guys are doing an amazing job. That sounds like a good gratitude good. exercise to do. Yeah, it's very uh, very sort of calming uh, to do that. I think it's uh, it's a great thing. You talk about data. I also have to ask you about tech then. Yeah. So what role does tech play? Because that has been the big big play in the pandemic and now as well that tech is you know the the things that some people even been so extreme to say it's gonna save hospitality mm, yeah. um but it seems like i guess you're from from different place but what role does tech play in, a, in in scaling a business like yours so i have a real uh battle with this because i in my personal life i'm sort of tech obsessed i love tech i love things that make my life like 0.02 percent better uh and you know so i have you know ludicrous things like watches that talk to phones and god knows what else like all that stuff i i, I get it and i like it my concern is that with hospitality 
anything that is tech is taking is, is, is a layer between human to human contact, essentially. And human to human contact is what hospitality is all about. So the romantic in me wants to say that actually it's it's the humanity that makes hospitality a thing that 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 people want to keep doing. And, and that doesn't exist in a retail environment. You don't go to Topshop because of the connection you have with the store salesperson. You don't go to Topshop at all because it's gone. <laughs> but uh, you know that, that retail thing is, is about the stuff. And it, actually, if you can make that stuff quicker, look at Amazon, if you can just get the stuff to you without any of the noise, people want that. But actually, the noise is what makes hospitality the great bit. And so if you if you, you know, even silly things like the McDonald's experience to me is lesser for going in and tapping on a screen. I, it just you don't have that same like interaction. Like what's happening today? What's special? Yes, the screen churns out all the things you can buy, and yes, they sell more because people are more willing to upgrade when they're not talking to a human than than you know. But I like that interaction with a human. I like you know. I, weirdly, I had it yesterday in Five Guys. I took my son to Five Guys in Brighton uh, and just got chatting to the guy behind the counter because we were waiting for it. It was very quiet, weirdly, for Five Guys. That never happens. And, you know, how long have you been doing this job for? And he was saying he's going to be an apprentice and he wants to work in at, for Audi and he's got a job coming up. And that was just a lovely little moment that happened because we were waiting for it. And, you know, Five Guys is not the place it's sort of the, you know, that you'd expect to have that kind of interaction. But... If that had been on a screen, it wouldn't have happened. Mm. And I wouldn't have noticed that it hadn't happened. I wouldn't have. But my day was definitely 0.02% better for it. So I really, so that's a long long way of saying I want to put loads, I I, I want to protect hospitality in Peace Pilgrims by not putting in loads of tech. That said, I do think there are use cases for you know, if, if I'm working in the city and I've got half an hour lunch break and I want a pizza pilgrims, but I also have to read a report for a meeting I've got at one thirty, I can 100% see how that guy or girl wants to come in, order on their phone, pay on their phone, get the pizza, not interact with anyone and just have that experience. So I think, you know, we're going to have to offer that experience. Um, but what we've got to make sure we don't do is offer it at the detriment of the people who don't want it. So I think we need to put in some tech that is seamless. So if you want to, if you like ordering on your phone, you know how to do it, you can do that entirely. If you don't have a mobile phone, I don't know who that person is, you you know, you can have the full old school experience. And the old school experience should always be the like primary experience hmm. to me. It's, like, it's about that interaction. Like, you know, it's what's the waiter's favorite dish or, you know, those kind of things that you can't get from a screen. It's interesting. It's about keeping the soul again, which you set it's out. It's massive. From. It's massively important, and that yeah, that comes with it—the bumps and you know, the the ups and the downs, and this kind of like completely formulaic but guaranteed to not let you down version of the world is it's just boring. Like anything that's a sure thing is boring. Hmm. So from my point of view, even when things go wrong because of the human, that's what makes life's great rich tapestry, which I'm sure is incredibly bad business sense, but. What about the future, Tom? Uh, what are the business priorities right now? There's, there's there's a lot of noise in general in the industry, but what is your speeds of pilgrims, your top priorities right now? Uh, I think we're still, we're just about looking to the horizon. Just mm. about. Obviously, there are huge challenges still coming at us, but we're, you know, we're feeling more on top of them than we have done ever. Um And so, you know, I think the future is, this is an incredibly boring answer, but I think for now it's just like keep building what we've built. There's nothing that I'm coming down the road and it's like we need to fundamentally flip this or we need to go and open in America or mm. continental Europe or we need to start doing tacos because there's a better, you know, there's nothing exciting like that coming on. But keep, you know, keep sticking to our guns. Like if we're going to open a pizzeria, feel really confident it's the right thing to do, that it's bringing something new to the table. Um, I think, you know, again, hugely important for me is that we're a company doing doing the right thing by the, by the world. So we've started our journey towards net zero um, and we've, we, you know, we're hiring a person to, to be dedicated to that and like see how we can be better. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that journey is very much underway. The other one that we've started is B Corp, which is a... Um, 
sort of accolade that uh, you know more and more businesses are getting now, which is great. Which is it, it basically is a way to show that the business you're running the business with a view to being better for everyone, not just profit making. So it's you know it's based on your input to the community, obviously looking after your customer, looking after your team, looking after the planet. Um, so you know it's it's a good sense check that you are you know trying to run the business in the best possible way for humanity uh and so we're working on that on that journey as well we i think we're hopefully you know we're one of the hoping to be one of the first people in hospitality to get it i think that i'm only aware of one other hospitality company that has it currently so you know doing more of that stuff i think is going to be is going to be crucial um but yeah i think you know as i was saying earlier like the danger is you're like well what's next what's the new thing mm. and actually you know, anything, most great things that, you know, most great brands and products that you love, you know, they're, they're not about radical change. They're about 1% every day. Yeah. So I think the boring answer is keep getting a little bit better every day. What is, um, what about the uh, the industry? How do you see that as being part of the industry for 10 years where there's been lots of excitement, development, ran into the pandemic and How do you see the the coming years ahead? And there's a big play being played out right now, in general, in the industry where all the costs are back, and you know, yeah, uh, everything is just seems a bit more difficult again. The notch is just dialed up, even though we're back open. Yeah, I, I 100 agree. I think you know, everyone is finding it that bit more difficult. But I, I think you know, there's a lot of people out there who you know, because it's a bit harder than it was and now going, oh, well, it's all it's all ruined and, like, you know, it used to be really easy and now it's really hard and therefore, you know, it's never going to be the same again. And I, I just I just think at the core of what we do, there's such a fundamental human need of, like, meeting up and having a good time with your fellow people that, like, it will it will survive. It'll find a way, for sure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I I guess, you know, there's so much rise of, like, quick service and that kind of stuff like you know is that is that going to be the next thing is it is it about the food is it about the the, the kind of interaction moment obviously delivery is a fascinating thing because that you know that's an ever-growing phenomenon and so you know there's one half of me is like absolutely if we can provide that family meal moment at home you know then we've done our job that's what we're there to do but obviously i also feel like yeah but it's not quite the same it's not we're not quite got that full that full piece of programs hit so yeah what are, you know where, where's the industry going I, you know i think i think there are still so many fantastic leaders in this business i mean you've had will obviously from hawksmoor I, i don't know if it was in this room but he um you know he's one of those people you just look up to and go like if he's if he's one of the people that i was looking up to actually the world's going to be fine mm. That's super interesting. Um, what about um, your own learning as a leader the last two years? What is like the biggest one you take away from it? The biggest learning I've had is, I mean, the, the number one thing for me is like knowing where my weaknesses are, and I have many, and then making sure that we have people who absolutely have those things of strengths. Um, and I think we we've now, you know, My problem is that I always want everything to be perfect. Now, I, I know you look at Peter Pilgrim and go, it's not perfect. <laughs> But, uh, you know, my brother's response to that is like, why are you running a restaurant business then? Because by definition, <laughs> it will never be perfect. So probably if it was just me running Peter Pilgrim's, we would have one pizzeria and I would be like absolutely agonizing over every single part of it. And we wouldn't be, you know, we every decision would come with this like incredible amount of analysis paralysis and overthink and actually my brother's version of it is just crack on like the good things will you know the good things will rise to the top and the bad stuff will fall to the bottom and it'll all be good in the end the answer is somewhere in the middle i think that's why we're a good team yeah um and I, i've chatted to a few people who are who work in a team in restaurants i won't name any names but it does feel like there is a thing of like there's one who's like just do it what's the worst that could happen and the other is like have we thought of every possible outcome and actually you need both those people to get to get You know, yeah, something that is because the, the the crap won't sink to the bottom on its own, and the good won't rise to the top. You've got to be constantly yeah. like peeling back the layers and looking. And so, but my learning is like you know you've you've definitely got to like let things happen. Momentum is hugely important for a business, and 
you know, whilst I would love to be constantly like tweaking under the bonnet of everything, I think that that would come with a much slower, much less energetic business. And I think that would ultimately be a bad thing. Mm. So allowing allowing things to happen that maybe are not like as perfect as you had in your mind is crucial. And mm. letting, you know, also seeing when things don't go so well and almost like not celebrating that, but like making sure that, you know, we all kind of get together and go, right, that didn't go how we'd hoped. What do we do next? How, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? That kind of stuff. I think if you don't let stuff like that happen, you can't learn anything. Mm. Um, how do you show up? strong every day as, as a leader how do you make sure that you are set out to succeed on the day wow that's a big question um i don't know i i guess like do you have like a a practice you do or a no, framework no. not mark Wahlberg. i'm not going up at 2 a.m to work out or anything like that no i think probably the number one thing i have is which you know is a blessing and a curse but it's like being available i guess like is my number one thing so like we've got this thing in the company called workplace now so everyone's on it so you know whether you started yesterday or you've been here since you know for five years we're all on the same platform together and anyone can message anyone and you know i really encourage people to like contact me directly if there's something i can do to help and quite often i can't but i can certainly like put point you in the right direction and make sure that that person is engaged with your issue so Yeah, I think being available to to help and not being kind of off doing other stuff, mm. trying to be where the problems are, I guess, um, uh, and, and you know, lending support of, you know, what is it that we're going to do together to get through this? I think it is a crucial thing. So that that's how I make myself. I think being a good leader is is to be available and to be able to help people when they need you. And you talked a lot about humanity before as well. Is that also compassionate? leadership you you talk about there like you know being there being available to take action be, yeah to be compassionate when people need it i think it's i think it's absolutely crucial and i think it, what fills me with so much joy is that i think the team and the teams in pizza pilgrims do live like that there is a really compassionate vibe like we, our best teams certainly are the ones that are all out for each other and you know like you know let's not let's not be around the bush there have been some challenging times you know there's been Days when you know when we you know when well right at the beginning of the pandemic when Boris was like don't go and eat out, but there was no support. You know I think a lot of a lot of companies at that point pulled the ripcord and got rid of a lot of their teams, and we didn't. We were like look that's gonna we're gonna keep trading as much as we possibly can, protect as many jobs as we can, and obviously then furlough came along and you know just completely saved the day. But we never had that moment where we we're like right we're turning our back on all of this mm. and like. You know, I think I think being there as the decision maker, you know, ultimately me and James are still ultimately the decision maker in Pizza Pilgrims. There's no like board man or, you know, a chairman or someone with a suit who could tell us what to do. Like ultimately, it's still our decision. And and knowing that you're going to make the right decision in those in those moments is is a huge part of of being a leader, I think. Um, and we feel so proud that we've built this thing that we still are in control of. Like, you know, the, the the decisions that we make are our decisions. And yes, like, I know that we've made some wrong ones. <laughs> but hopefully there's some solace in the fact that when we make a wrong decision, you know it was us. You <laughs> can get me on workplace. You can tell me that it was the wrong decision. <laughs> and we can try and fix it. Whereas if it's like you don't know who made the decision and it's the wrong decision, then how do you how do you go about fixing it? So, yeah, I think it's been it's been really, really, really tough this last two years. Undoubtedly, the toughest in my short tenure in hospitality obviously and we couldn't have got there without without you guys pulling together and dealing with some incredibly challenging things mm. from you know both all the masks and sanitizing to the lack of security to the you know under understaffed under resourced teams as we come back and all of that stuff but you know just rest assured that we are putting everything into to moving the dial and we will we will get there Two questions left for you, Tom. Um, the one of them is: uh, What advice would you give to to other leaders out there? What is your top advice? Because we all are able to bring something to the leadership table. I mean, the number one thing that I see with uh, with what I would describe as bad leaders is like you can tell that they're going into any conversation having made a decision already. I just it's my number one 
failing for people is like if you're going to have the conversation either make a decision and just be like completely you know war general decision maker and be like it's me this is the decision let's get on with it or actually listen to the team and be ready to change your mind but the worst version is like you've already made the decision you then have an engagement with the team who have a different point of view and then you're like yeah but no we're going to just carry on I, I just think that that's the worst trait so I, I try and listen to the team and like yeah. try and like shape my thinking around it on the flip side I, I can definitely be like too far the other way and like you know one person in one site says this is a problem and I'm like shit maybe we need to change everything mm. so you know it, it's you've got to have a balance but I think I think just listen like listening to your certainly for us it's it's very easy because we've got incredible people at, you know in the exec team and, and they've got a huge amount more experience in hospitality than we have you know Gav has been working in hospitality for 25 years so you know, if you didn't listen to him, you'd be you'd be a fool. But it's interesting with the listening, because because we come through a period of you know chaos and in principle war at the front line. If you, you use that terminology, you needed to make some decision, but now you actually need to step back for that and actually yeah. start listening, understanding. But you often get you know your head in the trenches, and you know you just continue because it becomes behavioural. Yeah, Almost. and it's easy because you you don't have to listen to others because you are the one with the answer. But that's the perfect decision. The perfect balance to me is like when when, the, when there is nothing coming, like at the beginning of the pandemic, no one was sitting around going like, "Cool, I've been in this situation before. This is what we're <laughs> going to do." Everyone's like, "Well, what the, what the hell do we do now?" Yeah, and actually having the uh, being able to step back and go, "Right, this is what we're going to do," is is that's a great trait. So like the, the, in the dream scenario is like you can you can fill the void when there is no one speaking. But when there are people speaking who have a genuine point of view, you can listen and adapt your decision making to that. That that's the perfect thing, because um, obviously, the, the, you know, the opposite end of the scale, the worst kind of leader is the person who doesn't know what they want to do and is just listening to the team and has no. You know, yeah. you've got to have a bit of a bit of both. I think. What is the uh, one question you wished I'd asked you, and what would have been your answer? The one question you wish I'd ask, uh, I'd wish you'd asked me. My daughter started asking me what my 17th favorite color is, which is incredibly, uh, when you start to unpack it, quite a sort of big <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, what is the one question that, probably, uh, what's your favorite pizza? And I think the answer is, it's still Salsiccia and Friarelli, which is sort of basically on the menu now for no reason other than like, it's my favorite pizza. <laughs> it doesn't really sell, but it's just such a great pizza. Uh, proper Neapolitan classic. Such a boy, you know. I bet you were hoping for a much, much more exciting answer than that. No, it's a, it's good and simple and very human. Pizza uh, is the core of what we do. We mustn't forget that. Um, uh, where can people find you and more about Pizza Pilgrims if they haven't really dived into what Pizza Pilgrim is and what it's all about? Uh, yeah, so we're you know on all those kind of social media y things um, and pizzapilgrims.co.uk. The internet is a good source of uh, stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, why not just cut through all of that nonsense and go and have a pizza? We have pizzerias in <laughs> London, we have one in Oxford, and we're opening one in Brighton soon. So yeah, come and try some pizza. Yeah, we we'll look forward to that down here. Thank you so much for, for joining. No Tom. worries. Thank you for having me. What a pleasure. Amazing, Tom. Thank you so much for sharing with us how you build a team and a brand from the inside out and how you as a company can strive becoming 1% better every day to achieve mastery. You should now reflect on how you can build a culture that drives your brand. To get further inspiration on how to build a business from the inside out, visit episode 122 with Tom Barton, co-founder of Honestberg, on Leading by Example. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels, which all can be done via our website, hospitalitymavericks.com A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. Check them out at bizsimply.com on via their social at bizsimply or bizsimplyhq. You can also email them directly at advice at bizsimply.com A big thank you to Fina Charlson who is a show producer and editor for the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to the newsletter for more Maverick Insights 
and ideas at hospitalitymavericks.com. Don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. I'm Michael Tingsa, and you've been listening to the Hospitality Maverick Podcast Show. Be Maverick!